What's up everybody, Joe Brown here. This is the Heresy Financial Show. A question that I've seen talked about a lot recently is are interest rates actually negative in real terms? Obviously with the two year closing in today at uh, two and a half percent, the 10 year 2.8% and the 20 year just clipped over 3% for the first time in a long time. It looks like interest rates are going up. And then when you factor in inflation, which just hit eight and a half percent, the flip side comes in and says, yes, but those higher interest rates are still negative in real terms. But the question is, are they really? Because there's something that many people are not taking into account. And that is the duration of the debt. Ready? Let's dive in. All right, guys, real quick, in just a few weeks now, I'm going to be speaking at the Market Disruptors Live Conference in Dallas, May 6th through 8th. I would love to see you there. It's going to be a fantastic conference, two or three days, depending on the tickets that you get. And there's going to be a lot of heavy hitters at this conference as well. Love to see you there. I've got a link in the description below for you to sign up. All right, let's take a look here at the uh, inflation rate. Blue line is going to be CPI, and red line is going to be uh, CPI minus food and energy, so that's called you know core CPI. Now, obviously, for most people, near inflation rate is going to be a lot higher than this, but we're just going to use these official numbers because um, you know it it, uh, it still makes the point. So right now, in March of 2022, the inflation rate you can see it was eight and a half percent, a little bit over eight and a half percent. Now, what that's measuring is the change in prices from one year prior. So from March of 2021 through March of 2022, prices on average increased by 8.5%. So you look at the, let's say this two-year treasury here, and we see uh, the interest rate on it is two, almost 2.5%. Two What's going on here is basically... You give $100 as a loan, you get $102.50 back, roughly. That's a 2.5% interest rate. Let's just say, to make things easier, let's make it 3%. You give $100, you get $103 back. But the problem is, that's the two-year interest rate. That's the yield on the two-year debt. If we go back and look, in, uh, prices, at least the CPI, has not been 8.5%. Uh, for two years. If we look back what it was a year ago in March of 2021, the CPI was only hitting 2.6%. So it's gone up a lot recently. A year ago, it was 2.6%. Now we also have to look at what interest rates were on the two year one year ago, uh, just for uh, um, uh, accurate comparison. And uh, interest rates on the two year were down here at 0.15%. So rates have gone up a lot, obviously. But the question still is, why are interest rates lower when inflation is so high? It means the expectation is of the aggregate, this is a consensus thing because it's all the buyers, all the sellers coming in, bidding up the price or pushing down the price of what's being bought and sold, in this case a bond, and saying, coming up with the, the consensus price, saying that the expectation is that the interest rate will be positive for the lender at the end of the maturity of that loan. So if you go and you give $100, you say, I'm gonna collect $3 each year on this. At the end of this time period, this two years, I'm gonna collect $3 each year, I'm gonna come away with $106. You are saying as the lender that at the end of that two years, you will be able to buy at least $106 worth of the stuff that you would have wanted to buy anyway when you made the loan. And that is a key point here because we're looking at the CPI eight and a half percent right now. You're wondering who in their right mind is making a two year loan at two and a half percent when the CPI is currently printing at eight and a half percent. One of two things is happening. Either the expectation of the lender is that that inflation rate is temporary, that that inflation rate will go down probably significantly in the mind of the person who's making that loan and saying, yes, from last year to right now, prices went up by 8.5%. But over the next two years, I don't think that's going to happen. I think prices will increase at a max of 1%, let's say. I think prices might decrease. And so whoever is making this loan is looking out two years ahead and saying, it doesn't matter what inflation was for the last year, I'm looking forward and pricing in the chance that, uh, that this loan will pay me back 
in a, in a positive yield and give me back more purchasing power than what I lent. And two and a half percent is the consensus as, as to what that would take. Now you might be thinking, okay, but still who in their right mind thinks inflation is gonna slow down to that extent? I mean, even if we look at the 10 year, the 20 year, the 30 year, they're pricing in 3% uh, in terms of the uh, erosion of purchasing power over that time. So it looks as if the market is pricing in some major deflation, um, especially if we get one or two years of uh, persistent inflation from here, you need prices to come down significantly. Uh, the longer the inflation lasts, you need prices to come down significantly to counteract that initial loss of purchasing power. So the other thing that we have to take a look at is what prices are being measured here? Because uh, right here, we're looking at CPI is 8.5%. But uh, who, who is that measuring the prices increasing for? That's regular old people. That's the average Joe. That's somebody going to work, going home, buying groceries, paying rent. That's for the average person. Now, who is making these loans? Who is lending uh, money to the U.S. government? Who is buying two-year treasuries, 10-year treasuries, 30-year treasuries? It's not the average Joe. It's not the person going to work, clocking in, going home, paying their car lease, paying their car payment, going through fast food. It's not your average Joe. That's absolutely not the person who's investing in this. It's largely institutions and mainly financial institutions. So either they're looking at this as a very short-term play for liquidity, just a basically a savings account, and they're not planning on holding this to maturity, or they're looking at this and saying, hey, I know CPI is printing at eight and a half percent, but my costs are rising by half a percent, one percent. Your major financial institution, they're not worried about gas prices. They're not worried about uh, rent increases. They're not worried about the grocery store. All they're doing is booking profits here. And so, yes, they do have expenses. Big banks have expenses, obviously, but they're not looking at the CPI. Mainly, they're going to be concerned about wage inflation, which is why banks like Goldman and uh, JP Morgan and a couple others have complained uh, over the last you know couple of months about how much wages have risen. But ultimately, when they're looking at these, uh, these uh, interest rates of 2.5% to 3%, it's very likely that even if the CPI prints at 8.5%, 9%, 10% for the next couple of months, even the next year, they're still going to be A-OK. -okay. They're still going to be fine because their costs are not increasing like that. So they're still booking profits on this. And finally, I know I've talked about this before, but I'd like to take a look at how high interest rates could go before it starts to become a problem for the US government, because we know this is mainly US government debt. That's what treasuries are, this US government debt. So when you buy a treasury, you're loaning money to the government. And so as their debt matures, they've got a lot of short-term debt, as that debt matures, they have to borrow more to pay off the old debt and then borrow more to pay, that's what a deficit is, to pay what they don't uh, get in taxes. So if you have to pay this, much in your expenses for the year, you only bring in this much from taxes, you have to make up the shortfall with borrowing. So that means you have to borrow enough to pay off all your old debt that is maturing and borrow enough to pay that uh, gap between what you brought in from taxes and what's left over to pay. So right now, this is about a year old. Uh, so it's a little bit dated from uh, Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, crfb.org. You can see here interest payments at about $303 billion compared to uh, vet and military retirement, transportation, disability insurance, food stamps, housing, all the way down. And so obviously this chart is ignoring the major expenses for the federal government, but it's just showing everything that it's bigger than, basically all the major categories that it is bigger than. So it's a big expense. If we scroll down here, um, what we see is that if interest rates on average for the government, because we have to take a step back and realize that if interest rates today shot up to 10%, that wouldn't do anything to the federal government right now. They're still just paying off their old debt at the old interest rates as it matures. What it matters for, what it starts to do is all that new debt starts to become more expensive for the federal government. So if they pay off a billion dollars and they borrow a billion point two, now that billion point two has a much higher interest rate than what they just paid off. So their expenses over time will increase, but not instantly. So take back at take a look back at this chart here, 303 billion right now. On average, if their interest expenses go 1% higher, 2% higher, 3% higher, eventually the interest payments alone get higher than Medicaid, higher than Medicare, higher than defense, 
and eventually get higher than Social Security. So if on average, the federal government's average weighted uh, interest rate goes up by 3%, 4%, it'll be the largest expense that they have. At that point, what will happen? 100% what will happen is the Federal Reserve will have to resume QE at some point here and uh, start to buy up that debt because once it gets too expensive, you enter into a spiral where just to pay off the interest, you're taking on uh, a lot more debt. And that's just a, it's nobody lends in that scenario. And so what the central bank always does, this has happened many, many, many times throughout history, the central bank has to monetize all that debt. They have to print money to buy that debt. So the federal government owes to the Federal Reserve at that point. And then the Federal Reserve takes all their profits and sweeps them back to the treasury, back to the federal government. So any debt that the Federal Reserve owns is interest-free debt to the United States government. So if it gets to the point where interest rates do start to go up and their average interest expenses altogether, their interest expenses on their debt gets to be a line item on their budget that is way larger than everything else that they're paying, you know at that point the Federal Reserve will just own all the debt and so that will reduce the net expenses for the federal government at that point point, it will bring it down and it will no longer be a burden on the government. I hope that makes sense. And the takeaway here is don't be a lender. And if you're a saver, you're a lender. If you have a pension, you're a lender. If you have a 401k with mutual funds in it, you're most likely a lender. If you have a money market fund, you're a lender. If you have any cash whatsoever inside the financial system, you're a lender. And so that's okay as long as you realize it, as long as you understand that at any moment, it could be locked up, it could be frozen, you're keeping it for liquidity purposes, it's not every thing you have. You're not waiting, sitting on cash, waiting for a crash, because at that point, who knows if you'd have access to it. And don't be sitting there lending at 1%, 2%, 3%, because your expenses are going up by at least 8.5% every single year at this point. And uh, it's very likely, very probable that that gets even worse. And so you have to contribute more and more savings just to keep up. You have to contribute more and more labor, stored labor, stored capital into that savings pool just to not have that purchasing power decline over time just to keep uh, keep up with where it was at before. So don't be a lender, don't be a saver unless you realize that the purchasing power is dwindling and you have a specific purpose for it. Otherwise, invest in assets that historically keep up or perform better than inflation. As always, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.